So I guess to sum up one of the top things uh, that our group was on to for the ethics of digital media uh, was first, uh, you know, protect the public uh, from harm. I guess generally anybody that is uh, in the just digital media or digital industry, uh, you know, needs to have the public interest in mind. Other things that uh, I think we uh, made a point on uh, was uh, things like uh, following copyright law, you know, for WIPO and, uh, you know, the international copyright organizations uh, and to make sure that we're, you know, just not stealing uh, intellectual property, uh, misciting, uh, mis uh, you know, and plagiarism, especially in the academic world. Other issues? And I think that uh, mainly that's that's what I uh, that's what I got, that's what I uh, got uh, from uh, just the limited time I was there. Okay. Anyone else from the ethical group would like to add anything to Keith's summary? I think the biggest thing is knowing uh, probably best practices and guidelines for digital media. And I wonder if I guess I'm posing the question back out to you, Dr. Johnson, if those change over time. And that's something that you would need to keep up with because digital media is constantly changing. And that's a very good point. Did in your discussion at any point did uh, something called Creative Commons come up? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay, no, not at all. I'm familiar with it. I'm not surprised. I'm going to put the link here, and then again, I'm winging it a lot with the new tool. I'm going to add a window called Web Links. Okay. Hopefully, you'll see Web Links 6 and then something called Creative Commons. If you click on that and browse to it, you will be taken to a alternate licensing, I guess is the way that I would put it, of content. Creative Commons was developed in response to what was happening with digital media and people wanting to either control their work in a way other than copyright law or if you're like me to make their work available to a wide audience but still contain control over it and so with creative commons you can license your material things that you put on the web with licenses such as attribution. You can use my work, but you have to say that it was my work. Share alike. If you use my work and share it, you have to share it with the license that I have given you, which is basically give it away to everybody. And so some people may want to use materials that are like that, some may not. I'm going to try a real quick screen share here. Are you all seeing the screen share? And so you now see the Creative Commons page. But something you might not be aware of, if you go to things like, let's do an image search on Amazon. So somebody give me, give me something to search for Amazon. And let me get the chat window up here in case you type it in. What should I search for? On Amazon? Yeah, well, I'm sorry, on Amazon, on Google. On Google. I said Amazon, I meant Google. So I'm going to do a Google search for an image. Sure, the uh, uh, Eiffel Tower. How do you spell Eiffel? Yell Tower, okay. So if I do a Google search and I select images, here are a number of images of the Eiffel Tower. Everybody seeing that okay? Should be coming in. What you may not be aware of is under search tool, there's something called usage rights. And these usage rights are Creative Commons usage rights. So if I select labeled for reuse, these are images 
that I can go in and legally and ethically use based on their license. So I'm scrolling over one that's in Wikimedia, uh, which is going to be a, probably an open source one. Uh, let me see if I can find one. Pixabay, my favorite place to find images. Flickr, okay. Flickr is a good place to go look. So I'm going to go look at Flickr. And here's someone's personal photo. And he is saying, and I say he because it's Alfie Iani, that there are some rights reserved to this photo. And if I click on some rights reserved, it will take me to the Creative Commons license and say that I can use this image, but I have to attribute and indicate if I made any changes to it. So going back to that image, if I decided to say crop it at all, I first have to attribute to Alfie Iannani and say that I cropped it from the original image. But Creative Commons is a really great way to find images that you can use in, a, in an ethical way. So let me clean up some pods here and switch now to our safe usage. Uh, who would like to summarize the safe usage? Okay, so in our group we talked about four main themes. Um, the first one was managing personal information, so trying to keep all your personal information confidential and private. Um, the second theme was about cyberbullying and how we can protect ourselves and our children from the harms of cyberbullying. Um, and then the third theme was about um, how we can surf the internet um, safely through um, using anonymous search engines and um, the private browsing function. And the last theme was about managing pictures. So um, trying to um, post pictures but keep them private or asking for consent from maybe schools not to, or not giving consent to schools about um, posting children, your kids maybe uh, pictures online and, and so on. So. Okay, great. Yeah. So I will be sharing the full conversations of both chats along with the recording of this meeting. The one thing I'd like to add to the keeping safe is something I've recently become aware of and, and quite honestly didn't think of. How many of you and you can do a little check mark or just say yes or no. When, you're, um, when you've created a password for a site and they ask you for those personal questions so you can recover the password, how many of you answer those questions? Okay. I did, too, until recently, when it was pointed out, okay, and Wendy says, I, I do, but I answer incorrectly. So this is something I would suggest that you think about going back and redoing with all of your accounts. It doesn't matter what you answer to that question. It's important that you remember the question and how you answered it. And so what I do is I will answer those questions with a what would be considered a nonsense answer. And I do that, and this is a Mac product. There are PC versions of this as well. But I use something called 1Password. So let me do a share pod again. So here's my 1Password account. And I'm not... Well, let's see. Let's pick something I don't mind you guys seeing. I'm not too concerned about 
you all seeing this because my password is encrypted and you're not going to be able to see it. But what I will do, and it's one of the things I really love about 1Password, is for example, if I create a new user login, there is a password generator. And I will ask it to generate up to around a 30 character password. And there are recipes, what they call recipes. I can put in hyphens, I can do digits, I can have symbols um, or just none. I usually use the digits. And what this does is it allows me to create a nonsense password for a site, but it also lets me generate nonsense responses to those questions about what hospital were you born in? The reason, and you all could look this up if you wanted to, uh, if you searched enough, I was born in Akron General. Um, if you did some searching about me, you would learn that I was born in 1954 in Akron, and there was only one hospital there at the time. So there are people who spend time searching for those types of answers. I post my pets on Flickr and other social media sites. So when they ask, what's my favorite pet's name? Who my favorite, uh, you know, what street did I first live on? Chances are that information's out there somewhere and people can search that. So I would just strongly recommend that along with everything else that you're going to see in the chats, that you think about ways that you can protect yourself online in terms of some of these other tools. So with that, we're uh, approaching the end of our meeting. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add to the conversation? Wendy, I agree, you do get overwhelmed. That's why I do recommend investing in some sort of a password saving program. The, uh, the reason I like 1Password, it, it is a Mac, I think it's a Mac only product. I've, I've actually never looked on the, the Windows site. But it, it will keep track of usernames and passwords for me. And if I change one on the fly, it will update the username and password. You know what? I'm going to, um, I'm writing myself a note to see if there's one for Windows. And I actually think 1Password is available for Windows, now that I think of it. Mundell, in theory, yes, they could be. In reviewing programs like this, 1Password has one of the heaviest encryption programs. Um, it is used by um, security agencies. But, you know, in, in, uh, in one sense, I think everything's hackable. Matt, I love that. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that's a great idea. Ooh, thank you, Liala. I don't see one password here, but... Okay, we're getting a little paranoid here, which may or may not be a bad thing. But, oh, <laughs> but with that, um, I think I will end this conversation before we go off into too much paranoia. You, just, you do have to use the tools, but I, I just want to end by saying that I think we can safely and ethically use them as long as we take uh, the precautions that have come up in the meeting tonight. So thank you, everyone.